Living the Farm Sanctuary Life is a book that I wrote to help people live more compassionately, live in a way that is more aligned with their own humanity and their own interests to eat food that is good for us and not to support a food system that's destroying the planet. And in the book, we talk about some simple things people can do on a daily basis to eat healthier food that's not contributing to the harms that animal agriculture contributes to. Things as simple as Meatless Mondays, where for one day a week, people try going meatless and that way they learn what they can do uh, to eat foods that are not animal-based and become more familiar with that, more comfortable with that. And that helps to ease the fear that often comes with the idea of changing. I think one of the biggest obstacles for people who want to live healthier is just the fear of change, the fear of failure, the fear of not knowing what they're going to eat or where they're going to get their nutrients. And in Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, we talk about all of that, about where you can get these nutrients, uh, how to prepare food that is tasty, that is satisfying, that is convenient, that is easy, how to set up your kitchen, um, you know, what you can use in, in place of animal foods. And it's getting easier than ever before. In fact, today, you go to mainstream grocery stores and you can find plant-based milks instead of cow's milk. And not just one kind of plant-based milk. You have almond milk and coconut milk and soy milk and hemp milk. And there's now combinations. So it's getting easier and easier to be vegan. And in Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, we provide simple steps and tools for people interested in exploring that lifestyle. Well, you know, with Farm Sanctuary, we work to rescue animals from cruelty and we want to demonstrate a more compassionate relationship with other animals. And I think that it's important to be consistent in our compassion, not only to non-human animals, but also to human animals. And I believe that to create real change, you need to do it in a non-violent way that is aligned with your ultimate hope, which is a non-violent world. And so behaving violently to other animals, including human animals, is not consistent in my mind with a vegan mindset and a vegan approach. Um, now, it's natural for human beings to get angry. I think, you know, there's that bumper sticker that says, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So I think there's a place for that, and I think um, it's natural to get angry and upset. But how do we take that energy and turn it into something productive is the key question. And if it results in violence, I actually think that that puts us backwards and doesn't help advance our efforts to create change in how society views and treats farm animals and how we relate to others and how we live on this planet. And we can do it in a way that is more compassionate and that's really the bottom line and, and that means not being violent. Well, on factory farms, animals are treated like unfeeling commodities. They're put in cages and crates where they're packed so tightly they can't even turn around, they can't move, they can't express their physical or psychological needs. Uh, they suffer both physically and psychologically because of this, and they're heavily stressed. They suffer on a daily basis. They're in misery. Uh, to keep them alive, they have to be fed enormous amounts of antibiotics. In fact, the majority of the drugs used in the United States are fed to farm animals to keep them alive and growing in these systems. And when you visit these places, you, you really feel the pain the animals are experiencing. You feel the stress of it. Um, I've walked into these gestation crate barns where you have pigs lined up in rows in these two foot wide metal enclosures, clanking and screaming and in misery wanting out and the air is thick with toxic fumes. When you walk into these places, you, it hits you in the face, both physically as well as emotionally, and it's not a good place for animals. It's not a good place for workers either. Workers routinely suffer from respiratory problems from breathing in these noxious fumes. In fact, they oftentimes wear masks or respirators. The pigs, of course, who live in these places have no escape, and they breathe that air 24 hours a day. Um, so it's a system that's bad for animals, it's bad for people, and the good news is we don't have to do that. How we treat other animals says a lot about who we are as a species. Uh, kindness to animals is obviously good for animals, but it's also good for us. It helps to bring out our empathy, our compassion, our connection with others. And I think one of the biggest problems we have in our world is that people are disconnected from each other. They're disconnected from the earth. They're disconnected from other animals. And um, it leads to misunderstandings and then oftentimes harsh judgments. 
And so connecting with other animals in a positive way, um, looking into their eyes, does something to us that is very positive. Whereas working at a slaughterhouse and killing animals or otherwise abusing them also does something to us that's not good. And we can choose to relate to others in a more positive way, in a mutually beneficial way. And to me, being vegan is about that. It's about creating mutually beneficial relationships and aspiring to live in a way that is as kind as possible. And, it's, and we're all works in progress. None of us is perfect. We all have things to work on, but it's an aspiration to continuously try to examine and, and do better. For, for some people who are stan eating the standard American diet and eating meat, dairy, and eggs on a regular basis, the idea of a meatless Mondays could look something like this. Uh, instead of having spaghetti and meatballs, you could have spaghetti and veggies in the marinara sauce. Or if you want something that tastes like the meatballs, there's lots and lots of plant-based alternatives now, and, and there are veggie meatballs you can get. So you can have spaghetti and meatballs, and it could be vegan. So that's one thing that you can do that'd be very easy. For cereal, if you have cereal in the morning, instead of using cow's milk, you could just use soy milk, or almond milk, or coconut milk, or oat milk, or hemp milk, or one of these plant-based milks. And another breakfast that's very easy and very common is oatmeal. And you can do that just with water and without any butter, but you can use a plant-based margarine, so that's an opportunity or an option if you'd like. You can also put veggies in, or, or other fruit. <laughs> you wouldn't want to put veggies probably in oatmeal, but you could put bananas, blueberries, raisins, nuts, uh, berries, uh, different kind of fruits like that in oatmeal. Um, so that might be a breakfast thing. Um, for lunch, a, a big salad. It's in, and a salad doesn't have to just be lettuce. It can be, for example, I make salads with arugula. I often add beans, different kinds of beans, whether they're garbanzo beans or pinto beans or black beans. Uh, and then uh, veggies like red peppers, cucumber, carrots, celery, and then some kind of a dressing. And I oftentimes use a goddess dressing with balsamic vinegar to make it a little lighter, or just some combination of those or other dressings you might like. So a big salad is really good to have. You could have veggie burgers, you could have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you could have hummus. I think oftentimes going to ethnic foods is a very good way for people to explore plant-based foods because historically human beings have eaten primarily plant foods. And this whole idea of eating hamburgers and animal foods on such a regular basis is fairly new. So if we go back into traditional ethnic foods, Chinese food, Mexican food, Ethiopian food, Middle Eastern food, Thai food, it tends to be largely plant-based. And so that's another really good way for people who are interested in trying more plant foods is to explore ethnic options. For many people, going plant-based is a series of small steps. You know, for example, eating less meat on a particular day and maybe even smaller portions of meat, and then they start replacing that with larger portions of plant foods. Some of those might be protein-based, some of those might be just more veggies and more whole grains. Um, so each person has to do what makes sense for them, but the key is to do something, and it could be very small. Um, it might just be a matter of eating more fruit. And if, for example, you eat an apple a day, like the doctors have advised for many years, you start filling up and you feel satiated so you don't have the craving to eat more unhealthy fast food or other animal or processed foods. So focusing on eating good food um, will nourish us, it will help us feel satiated, and it will prevent us in many cases from going back to the bad habits of eating fast food and other products that are not good for us. Human beings have an enormous impact on the planet through our activities. And one of our most impactful activities is our agricultural system and specifically the growing of animals for food. We could save more in terms of resources and in terms of cutting climate change by shifting to eating plants instead of animals than we could by changing the way we drive. The United Nations put out a report a couple years ago called Livestock's Long Shadow, and in that report they talked about how animal agriculture was one of the top contributors to the most serious environmental problems our planet faces, including climate change. So it's important that people are 
driving hybrid cars or walking or bicycling or carpooling or doing whatever they're doing to lighten their carbon footprint. But one of the most important things we can do is to change the way we eat and to eat plants instead of animals. For people who are in animal agriculture, say a rancher, for example, that has you know, a couple hundred cattle and he's raising them, he's invested in them, and he's expecting income based on those. I understand that that's kind of a tough spot. And what I would suggest is that that rancher and other people involved in animal agriculture start transitioning and using some of their land for plant-based agriculture. And if it's land that's used for grazing, that may not be the best land for growing crops, Something to consider is ecotourism. Lots of people want to be out in the country. They want to be in a natural green environment. They want to be around animals. So some of these ranches could even be transitioned into becoming sanctuaries. And that's actually starting to happen. So I think each person has to do what they can in the place where they are. Oftentimes change will happen incrementally, but it's about looking for solutions, looking for activities, looking for income sources that are more aligned with one's own compassion and aligned with one's own interests and don't cause unnecessary harm. And so growing plants instead of animals is an obvious shift and depending on the land, uh, that can sometimes be extremely profitable and extremely effective. And in some cases you can even build up the soil. So land or soil that's not that great can be built up by working it. Um, and then there are also side businesses that can come from plant-based agriculture. In addition to growing food and selling it, there can be services where, for instance, people help folks that have houses to transition their lawns into gardens. And there's a whole food not lawns movement right now. So in addition to actually growing food and selling it, people can provide a service to others who are interested in growing their own food or having their property uh, have a garden on it. But they may not have time to do the garden, so this would be another job opportunity. Um, and there's, uh, what's it called? There's um, landscaping, there's, uh, there's like, uh, you know, outdoor landscaping. You know, peop people can get involved with outdoor landscaping where they're actually helping to design gardens around new houses or even old houses and, and retrofitting them and creating a situation where people can grow food right at their own house. And, um, and that's really what you call local food. There have actually been a couple of ranchers, people like Howard Lyman, for example, who's quite well known now because he was on Oprah and talked about this, but you know, he was a rancher and he's now a vegan advocate. Uh, there are other people, in fact, there's a sanctuary in Portland or near Portland, Oregon, that used to be a family farm where they raised animals that is now an animal sanctuary. There's another one in Texas. There are people also in Massachusetts who I believe have done this. They used to be in animal agriculture and now they have become a sanctuary. There's another one in California. So there's a number of people now who are taking a different path and are not doing what their parents or their families have done and have a different sentiment about raising animals in a humane way and, and not killing and eating them. Um, and there are people also in cities who are kind of bucking the system. Sometimes homeowners associations or other neighbor groups aren't crazy about a lawn being turned into a garden. I don't understand it. I think a garden is much better than a lawn, which oftentimes comes with chemical fertilizers and unhealthy things. But sometimes neighborhoods want to have these lawns for whatever reason. Uh, but there are people that are starting to buck that system as well. There was a guy in Los Angeles, California, who actually started growing vegetables on the side of streets where there was little patches of dirt. And the city of LA came after him and discouraged him from doing that. But he fought back and he was able to actually get permission ultimately to grow vegetables in these public areas in Los Angeles. So change happens sometimes slowly, sometimes there's opposition to it. But if people sort of hold their ground, make a good case, approach it in a respectful, honest, compassionate way, uh, and have a solution, I think oftentimes uh, other people will see that and will ultimately embrace that solution. This idea of growing our own food and having community gardens or having victory gardens, as they were called during World War II, uh, is not a new thing. 
In fact, it's something that human beings have done throughout most of our history, and we've just gotten away from it over the past several decades. And I think people are rediscovering that growing your own food, harvesting your own food and eating it can be very empowering. It connect, can connect us to the earth. And the food tends to taste a lot better as well. You know, if it's, it's there fresh, um, and if we're growing our own food, it's gonna be a lot fresher than if we buy it in the grocery store where it's been harvested somewhere else and then shipped in. So growing your own food has lots of benefits. We tend to eat a fairly small variety of foods and grow a small variety of foods. You know, they call them commodity crops by the, from the USDA. They're corn and soybeans, for example. We could grow a huge variety of different kinds of fruits and vegetables and grains and plant foods. And I think that there are now farmers starting to experiment with new forms of plant-based agriculture. And instead of going for the commodity crops and the massive monocrop uh, farms, they're developing more diversified farms, more community-oriented farms. Um, Community-supported agriculture programs are popping up, and sometimes people involved with those want a variety of different kinds of vegetables. And it becomes a creative process when you have new, like a cherimoya fruit, for example. What do you do with it? Um, but these can be grown in certain parts of the country, and people are experimenting and getting creative and learning that there's a lot more out there than our typical uh, apples and bananas and oranges. There's lots of different kinds of fruit and um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for people in the farming business to grow these kinds of unique fruits but also to do further process to make jams and jellies for example of commonly used uh, plant foods or of new ones perhaps and maybe even combining them. So there's lots of opportunities for people that want to explore uh, plant-based agriculture, the plant-based food business, um, it's a really exciting time for people interested in that. In addition to growing food and harvesting one's own food, there's opportunities to harvest and sell seeds and to uh, reignite an interest in some of these traditional heritage types of foods that we've had for so long. And um, that's part of this food movement right now. Rodale has been doing it for a long time, but there are other seed savers that are, I think, growing and popping up and not only do you sell seeds but sometimes you can just share seeds so if somebody is growing certain crops in, at their house certain kinds of tomatoes for example they can give those tomatoes to a friend or share the seeds with a friend and then they can grow them the, the nice thing too about growing your own food is that you often have excess of what you need so then you give it to your friends and it becomes a very generous endeavor um, and then if your friend is growing something else and they have excess, they give it to you. And in this way, you could actually even coordinate where somebody you know, has a peach tree, for example, and somebody else has an apple tree. And you know, somebody has too many peaches, they share the peaches. Somebody has too many apples, they share the apples. And each person gets both peaches and apples and maybe a w wider variety of, of foods as well. So gardening um, and sharing like that also helps to build community and create community in a very healthy way. So at Farm Sanctuary, the animals are our friends, not our food, and people get a chance to come and interact with them, get to know them as individuals, to look into their eyes, and to see that there is somebody there. Not that different than the cats and dogs that we live with. Uh, in fact, Winston Churchill, when talking about uh, animals, said that dogs look up to people, cats look down on people, and pigs look you straight in the eye. And I think that's really true. If you ever look into a pig's eyes, they're very much like a human's eyes. And pigs are very vocal. They're very individualistic, like human beings. They're very intelligent. They have interests. They express their interests, and they want to do certain things. And they'll let you know that. Uh, we have pigs at the sanctuary, for example, who totally love belly rubs. And when you approach them and you touch their tummy, they will flop over and they'll start grunting in pleasure, communicating that they want you to keep rubbing their belly because they really enjoy it. Uh, these are animals that have feelings and they have relationships and like us and like other animals, they just want to enjoy life and they don't want to be abused, they don't want to suffer, they don't want to be afraid, uh, they want to have a good life. And at Farm Sanctuary, they're allowed to do that. And when the animals at the sanctuary enjoy their lives and they frolic and play, 
it brings joy to us as well because we can watch this and we can experience it along with them. And you contrast that with life in a factory farm where animals are in just misery and it affects you. You know, going into these places, you can sense the stress. It, it's palpable. Um, you breathe this thick, toxic air and it's palpable. And it's sick and unhealthy and cruel and violent and unnecessary. So Farm Sanctuary really is the antidote to that. It's a place where animals get to enjoy themselves, where we also get to enjoy their lives and their joy. And uh, it's a healing place. Healing place for the animals and a healing place for us. Because going into those factory farms time and time again is not easy. And um, it's even been said that animal rescue is the crack cocaine of the animal movement. And I can see where that comes from. You know, when you're able to take an animal out of that kind of a violent place and give them a good life and watch them heal, it helps you to heal from what you've observed. And you wanna just keep doing that. The tough part, of course, for farm sanctuary or any sanctuary is that you can't rescue them all. So the animals who we do rescue ultimately have to become ambassadors and we tell their stories and we encourage people to recognize that these animals, just like cats, dogs, and other animals, have feelings and deserve to be treated with respect. They have their own experiences and they have their own lives. And when we recognize that, I think it enriches our lives as well. At Farm Sanctuary, we encourage people to come visit. In many cases, we were able to get school children to visit and families, and um, it's really nice to see children interacting with animals. I think there's sort of a natural connection that kids have uh, before they start being acculturated to disrespect, especially farm animals. Um, most people, I think, are appalled to learn what happens on factory farms, and kids especially. Um, there have been a number of videos lately online where you see children just reacting when they learn that they're actually eating a dead animal. And it's really been heartening to see this and for those kinds of videos to be spread, for those kinds of sentiments and natural emotions to be celebrated and encouraged and shared. And I think the more that happens, the better because human beings are social animals we learn from those around us. And if everybody is doing something, we observe it, and the chances are, as human beings, we're gonna probably start doing it too, because that's all we know. And I grew up eating meat, like most people around me, because that's all I knew, everybody around me was doing it. But as time goes, and as there are more people who are not eating animals, and there are more vegans, those will now present examples. And children growing up, seeing these vegans, and in many cases, parents are having vegan children, um, there are new examples that children can follow. And rather than eating animals being the norm, there is now a question about whether that should be the norm. And the more vegans there are, I think, the more vegans there will be, because we are uh, social animals, we learn from those around us. And thankfully, there are more vegans now than there have ever been. And there are even a new generation of vegan children being raised uh, who've never eaten animal products at all. You know, over the years, we've worked to pass various laws to prevent some of the worst cruelties. You know, for example, we've been able to outlaw the use of gestation crates, which are two foot wide metal enclosures, veal crates, two foot wide wooden enclosures where young veal calves are chained by the neck and battery cages where egg-laying hens are confined so tightly they can't even stretch their wings. So we've been able to outlaw those in a few states and we've generally done this with the use of the initiative process which allows people to vote. And the reason we had to do that was because whenever we would introduce legislation to prevent some of these cruel practices, it would be referred to the Agriculture Committee either in the state capitol or in Washington, D.C. And the Agriculture Committee is made up of lawmakers very friendly to agribusiness. So we never got a fair hearing. So we had to take this to the people through an initiative where you collect signatures, put a measure on the ballot for a popular vote. And so we've done that, we've had some success. But those laws, frankly, are quite minimal. They only give animals enough space to turn around. And we need a fundamental shift. And I think it's important for policies to change 
but it's also important for the marketplace to signal where people want to go and for citizens to be more mindful, more conscientious, and not just to eat the foods they grew up eating without thinking about it. And that is starting to happen right now. Um, some of the fundamental policies I think that need to change though in Washington and also at the state level have to do with enabling this animal-based food system and externalizing costs associated with it. So when a factory farm pollutes the environment, they should be accountable to clean up the mess. There shouldn't be taxpayer support for that. Uh, animal agriculture should pay the fair cost for water and other inputs like corn and soybeans, which are heavily subsidized right now and used for feed for, for farm animals. So the main policies that I think should be changed in the near future, hopefully, would be those that enable and prop up this industry. Um, another thing that happens is that taxpayer money is used to buy excess production of things like cheese, for example. The government just bought $20 million of excess cheese to support the dairy industry. And besides financially supporting the dairy industry, by buying that cheese, the government is also promoting it because it's going to now feed that cheese to school kids and others who are on assistance programs. So the government is enabling this industry and also marketing and promoting this industry. And I think that needs to stop. I, I think the intent of government programs is to create a stable business environment for farmers because some years are much better than others. You have a bumper crop and then you have a drought and you have a very difficult year in some cases. So the government's intent is to sort of stabilize that and give farmers risk management tools so that they can grow food and basically be guaranteed that they're going to make a profit. The problem has been that you have big businesses that are recognizing this and are taking advantage of these risk protection tools and profiting from them. They realize that they can make very risky uh, decisions and if they made the wrong decision that they're, they're gonna be covered. So you have um, policies that were intended to help, in many cases, small farmers but they're being exploited by large businesses who are able to capitalize and make decisions uh, that are very risky, but without risk, because the government is there to bail them out. So in Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, we talk about encouraging people to make choices and to live in a way that is aligned with their own values and their own interests. And most people are humane, so most people would rather not support cruelty and unnecessary violence and killing. And most people would also, I think, rather eat food that is nourishing and doesn't make us sick. That's very much in our interest to do that. And also to support a food system that doesn't destroy the planet the way animal agriculture does. Unfortunately, we grow up in the United States and in many developed countries eating food that comes from animals who are horribly abused and so we say, don't tell me, I don't want to know, because it feels bad, we don't like it, it's not aligned with our compassionate values. So we live in this way, this sort of dissonant way, and, and I think there's some stress that comes with that, and it's not healthy. Uh, we also are eating animal foods and processed foods that make us sick, and so that's not in our interest. Um, and the good news is, though, that we can choose to eat a whole foods, plant-based diet and avoid all that animal suffering, avoid many health problems that have become rampant in the U.S., and we can also support a food system that's not destroying the planet the way animal agriculture is. So through our food choices, we can have profound impacts on our own health, as well as on the lives of billions of animals and on the planet itself. The United Nations put out a report a couple years ago talking about how animal agriculture is one of the top contributors to the most serious environmental problems we're facing. So our food choices uh, are very important to pay attention to, but most of us grow up, develop habits about food, assume that what we're doing is normal and appropriate in the way it's supposed to be. But I think we need to, to examine that and, and ask ourselves if our food choices are in fact working for us, working for the planet, are they good or not? And 
If they're not, we should make, think about making changes. And, and the good news is we can each be empowered to make changes. There are many things in this world that are outside of our control. There's wars, there's violence, there's all kinds of awful things happening that human beings are part of in many cases. But we are oftentimes quite removed from a lot of those. But when it comes to our food choices, every day each of us has a lot of control over that. And those choices have a big impact on our own health and on the health of the planet. So it's something that um, I think people can take heart from, people can be empowered by, people can ultimately then become encouraging advocates by eating in a certain way and improving their own health. There have been a number of times when I've met people who've told me that they've lost a lot of weight, they've gotten off of heart medication, their lives have changed physically, but also their outlook has changed. So emotionally, by eating better and improving their health, uh, they've in, improved also their mental health. And, and that's a whole other thing about food that we, I think, sometimes don't really talk a lot about is the emotional attachments that come with it. And um, that's one reason I think that changing can be so hard because people have this attachment to food and the emotions that come around it. Um, but when we look at it and step back and ask ourselves if those are healthy emotions, um, if the food is healthy and good for us, then oftentimes it makes sense to, to shift and, and to change. And that is scary. Uh, even if we're doing something that is better for us, if it's not familiar, it can be very scary. Uh, but when you start taking small steps, those often lead to more steps. And over time, those can create big changes.